So today I hear it. Who's taking the big physics test? Okay, half the class. Good. Uh, we will uh, make sure not to say anything too critical in the last five minutes of class to give those people a head start. And I'll say when everyone can get a head start. So we only interrupt everyone else once. But after that, um, I'll just do a dance for five minutes. How about that? <laughs> it, We'll cut the video off then, too, so it won't be on YouTube. Um, OK, so last time in class, we talked about. OK. Um, last time in class, we talked about the effect of size confinement on wave functions and how the how organic dyes derive their visible and uh, their, their electronic absorption from these transitions between wave functions in the, uh, in the occupied, what are called molecular orbitals. So the wave functions are the molecular orbitals to some higher unoccupied orbital. And the energy of absorption is, uh, is, is quantized by the particle in a box model to the distance between those energies. And what we're going to find is that the effect of size confinement is consistent across a range of different materials. And today we're going to talk about a particularly uh, interesting type of nanostructure called a quantum dot, which is just a semiconductor nanocrystal. I say just, not just. It's a quantum dot. So you take a semiconductor and you shrink it down. You shrink down the size to 10 nanometers, 7 nanometers, 5 nanometers. Sizes below 10 nanometers, the band gap begins to, to change appreciably, uh, where the band gap gets larger the smaller the dot becomes. And therefore, the more energy it takes from a photon to excite it, an electron to a higher energy level from the uh, valence band to the conduction band. And then, as usual, we have process thermalization down to the band edge, and then uh, relaxation of the de excitation, uh, which corresponds to, uh, to emission of a photoluminescent photon or a fluorescent photon. So, what this is the basis of is quantum dot based solar cells. So this is an, an area of research. It was a bit more active in the, um, in the mid 2000s, um, but there's still some important research being done on it now. And also quantum dots are useful in uh, bioimaging and display technologies. So, uh, so what, what is useful, if we have a quantum dot or a film of quantum dots that can be sprayed like paint on a, uh, on a glass sheet, is that if we have light that's too bright for our eyes to look good in, in a display, for example, then those quantum dots will absorb the high energy light and re-emit it at a, uh, at a longer wavelength. So a, a lower, lower energy, larger wavelength, and it's more, uh, it, it produces a more vibrant type of display. So this is um, actually a question on, uh, on week two's homework, which will be posted um, uh, tonight. And, uh, but, I'll, but I'll basically give you all the answers today. Um, so how does size confinement work in, in three dimensions? And the, the absorption of a quantum dot is a bit like picturing a particle in a three-dimensional box combined with some complications arising from the fact that we have a hole, a positively charged hole left over in the, um, in the valence band as a result of kicking that electron up to the conduction band, and also that we're in a medium. So we're, we're, in, a, uh, we're, in, a, uh, we're in a semiconductor medium that has a dielectric constant because it's made of atoms that have charges that can be polarized and can screen electric fields. So we need to take into account um, uh, all of those, uh, those all, all, all two of those complications. 
Um, but first, let's look at what, what does a, a, a one-dimensional particle in a box look like if it's just extended to three dimensions. And we'll use, uh, we'll use Cartesian coordinates, forget uh, spherical uh, symmetry for now. So what is, a, what is a 3D particle in a box? Uh, look like. So the uh, the total energy in 3D is just going to be a sum along the energy in the x along the x axis, the y axis, and the z axis. And let's draw our box here. I always get into trouble when I'm drawing in three dimensions. So the uh, coordinate system that we'll use here is z going up, y coming out of the board, and x horizontal. And we'll call the lengths of this particular box uh, a, b, and c thusly, where a corresponds to x, b uh, corresponds to y, and c corresponds to, uh, to z. So in order to find the energies, we just add up all of the energies along each, uh, each axis. So the energy. Last time we had n squared h squared over 8 ml squared, but if you, if you factor out the h squared and the 8 m, and you have nx squared over a squared, and y squared over b squared, and then z squared over c squared, that gives you the total energy along, uh, along each axis. So we have h squared, which is Planck's uh, constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule second over eight times the mass of, of the particle times the quantity nx squared over a squared plus ny squared over b squared and nz squared over c squared. Now, what do the wave functions look like? Well, they look like a three-dimensional version of the uh, of the one-dimensional particle in a box wave functions. But it's but in, in one dimension we can draw these oscillatory sine wave looking wave functions. But in three dimensions we don't have a fourth dimension to show gradation, so we have to pick some kind of threshold in order to show where the uh, where the the density of the wave function is going to be the highest so the uh, so the ground state let's draw three this is my favorite optical illusion called a necker cube where you can't tell if it's facing into the board or out of the board. We'll just stare at it for like two minutes and see if you can get, get the box to interconvert. There it is, okay. Let's draw the ground state, psi 1, 1, 1 is a spherical blob in the middle. Now really, if I could draw in four dimensions, someday, someday I'll be able to draw in four dimensions. If I could draw in four dimensions, I would, sh I would show that this is kind of slowly tailing off somehow. But since I can't draw in four dimensions, you just have to picture it as a lobe. It's just this, this lobe where the boundary is not actually a strict boundary of the wave function, but just some threshold. 
Let's look at psi 2, 1, 1, where we have, uh, where we have n equals 2 along the x direction. So we have two lobes along the x direction. How about psi 2, 2, 2, where we are, um, where, where the wave function, or in the, the excited state along each axis. And what we have here is, are these lobes, which are toward the corners of, of the three-dimensional box. Okay, let's talk about quantum dots. So quantum dots, this is a, even, even our beta carotene example was not a real one-dimensional particle in a box. It had lots of atoms. We, had, we, you know, we said that this alternating arrangement of single and double bonds gave, it, was, gave a completely delocalized wave function. The fact is it doesn't there. The electron density is actually somewhat more localized where the bonds are actually drawn than between them. But we said, nah, forget all that. It's, it's completely delocalized. It's not actually. So there was a, the, the, the fudge factor. We said that it was, uh, was 18.5 uh, angstroms, 1.85 uh, nanometers across, which is a little bit too small than uh, for, for what, a little bit smaller than beta carotene actually is. Just like, uh, just like these three-dimensional particle, this three-dimensional particle in a box, we're ignoring, we can't map this directly to a system that's actually made of atoms and molecules because we have no dielectric constant here. We have, uh, we have um, no, no sea of electrons from which you're, you're, you're promoting one electron in the valence band to the conduction band. So we need, to, we need a couple of, uh, of, of fudge factors in order to get this to apply to an actual semiconductor nanocrystal. Has anybody ever seen, uh, anyone ever Google image, image searched quantum dots? So if you, if, if you do, um, any lab or research organization that works with quantum dots has their own great picture of like eight vials all lined up next to each other that give you all the colors of the rainbow. I, I highly recommend that, uh, that if you haven't seen this, that you, that you do a Google image search for it and you'll get Roughly 900 million uh, different photos of, of different uh, different quantum dot um, uh, 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 rainbows, basically. Okay, semiconductor nanocrystals. AKA quantum dots. What we're what the, the key is that we are going to account for the fact that there's a hole left behind in the valence band. Material itself that is the dielectric constant and of 
course, the effect of size confinement. So why does it matter that we account for the hole left behind in the valence band? Well, the hole left behind in the valence band has a positive charge associated with it. So when you promote an electron from the, from the valence band to the conduction band, there's actually a Coulombic attraction between the electron and the hole that was left behind. And that actually serves to, uh, to lower the energy and decrease the band gap slightly. That's the, that's the Coulombic uh, binding energy. Yeah. They are all, uh, they, they're, they're all wave functions. So any possible wave function will have this, uh, will have this form. Um, that could be a wave function of an, even an unoccupied. So you could have a wave function for, uh, for, uh, for two electrons, if, there, if one spin up and one spin down. You could have a wave function for uh, an unoccupied molecular orbital. They're just the allowed, uh, the allowed states in which the, in which in which a confined particle is allowed to have. And in fact, since a quantum dot has spherical symmetry, these aren't, these won't actually apply. So in, in my discussion here, I'll just, I'll just erase these. But this was the uh, the extension to uh, three Cartesian uh, coordinates. The quantum dot doesn't always have spherical symmetry. Um, in fact, in an example that I'll show on, on nanocrystal solar cells, they have rod-like or rice-like uh, shapes. And then they don't really call them quantum dots, they just call them semiconductor nanocrystals. Okay, so what we, what we end up having is that the, the energy of the quantum dot band gap equals the energy of the bulk band gap. This is the energy of a, uh, of a, of a, of a semiconductor of infinite extent. But for our cases, infinite extent is a couple tens of nanometers, while the, the effects of size confinement on the electronic structure are no longer present. So often we're talking about, you know, this is a very theoretical discussion, but what kind of semiconductor are we talking about? Well, um, metal uh, chalcogenides, lead sulfide, cadmium sulfide, cadmium telluride, are usually the favored materials to, to be used for semiconductor quantum dots. And let's just say, for example, the band gap of cadmium selenide, and this is sort of the prototypical example, so we'll, we'll continue to refer to these numbers uh, later on. The, uh, the bulk uh, band gap is 1.74 electron volts. So that corresponds to a photon with wavelength 1240 eV nanometers divided by 1.74. And I don't do arithmetic that well in my head, so you can see what you can uh, calculate what that is. Okay. So we have the energy of the bulk band gap. The band gap increases by an amount that is dictated by the particle in a box. And I'm not going to derive this. Uh, I'll just show it to you and sort of show you where it comes from. Uh, but you will almost certainly derive it in 204, or 104. So you have h bar squared pi squared over 2a squared, where a is the radius of the quantum dot. Times the uh, times the the reduced mass 
of the mass of the electron plus the mass, uh, plus one over the mass of the hole. Wait a minute. What's the mass of a hole? How can the absence of something have a mass? A hole uh, has a special place in um, semiconductor science because it's, it's, it's a real thing, but it's the absence of something. But it's also, you also need electrons to backfill the space where the hole was. So the mass of a hole in a semiconductor uh, valence band is actually the mass of the electron that's filling its place. So as the hole moves, the electrons have to fill in, have to fill in the old spot. Is that okay? Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the part of the, uh, of the equation that deals with uh, s due to size confinement in a spherical box. How can you have a spherical box? It's a spherical box. Trust me. Okay, then we have minus the energy. So the band gap is, uh, is lowered by this effect of Coulombic uh, attraction. So what we're going to write here is the Coulomb energy times some fudge factor. which is 1.8 squared over 4 pi epsilon times epsilon naught times A. Now, what are all these, uh, these terms? 1.8 is, is, the, uh, is the fudge factor, and the rest of this is just Coulomb's law between two free, uh, free charges. E, in this case, is the fundamental charge. That is the charge of an electron. Or a hole. Epsilon is the relative permittivity of the medium. Otherwise known as dielectric constant. Can everybody see it if I write down here? So, aka dielectric constant. What are the possible values of dielectric constant? Anybody know? It's dielectric constant of air. One. So this has to be, or vacuum one. Air is like 1.000 something. Dielectric constant has to be greater than or equal to one. In this particular case, the dielectric constant is also dependent on size, but we're not going to worry about it right now or ever until the next professor tells you you have to worry about it. The dielectric constant is what? The dielectric constant is the ability of a medium to screen charges. So if you have a charge and you're in a very polarizable medium, so dipoles and electron clouds can arrange themselves in such a way to lower the electrostatic energy of a charge, then that charge will have 
less electrostatic potential energy to interact with other charges. Electrostatic potential energy is something that can be used up in interactions. It's a little bit like your personal bandwidth. If there are a lot of people around you that uh, say, uh, want to get your attention, want your autograph, um, they know oh, I only have so much attention. I only have so much attention. I can only, only interact with, with so many, with so, so many people. Uh, just, like, just like that, charges and molecules and dipoles have, a, have some, di some amount of electrostatic potential energy that they can only uh, that they can only use up by inter that they can use up by interacting with other charges and dipoles. Now, if you're in a high dielectric constant environment, there are a lot of electron clouds and dipoles that interact with this charge that serve to lower its ability to interact with other charges. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good question. The question is, when it's humid out, you're less likely to build up a static charge. Um, you certainly can satisfy charges by having water molecules associate with them. Um, there is probably more to it than that, but I would need to, I'd need to look it up. OK. So this, uh, so what's this? This is the permittivity of free space. That's epsilon naught. Also, one pro tip: when watching these videos on YouTube or when listening to the podcast and going along with your notes or my notes. It's very helpful to speed me up uh, because I'm, I sometimes talk slow, and you've already seen the lecture. So speed it up to like to like factor of two, and then then when I'm writing long words like permittivity, you don't have to wait there for the next thing. Just, all right, per permittivity. Okay, this last term. What is this last term? Last term is due to Coulombic attraction. Due to uh, Coulombic attraction between the electron and the hole it leads, leaves behind. What is the consequence? The consequence is that as the size decreases, the band gap increases. And you can see that by the inverse 1 over a squared dependence on the, on the term that increases the band gap and the 1 over a without the square on the term that decreases the band gap. So as the size gets really, really, really small, the band gap goes up and up and up. And what do we expect from the fluorescent photons that a small uh, a small quantum dot would emit. They would be higher in en energy or lower in energy than the big quantum dots? Higher, higher in energy. Okay. So consequence, as the radius decreases, The band gap increases. Higher energy of photons.
Here are five quantum dots that have sizes two nanometers, 2.5 nanometers, three nanometers, five nanometers, and six nanometers. Not drawn to scale, obviously. Let's imagine that we are irradiating these, uh, these, uh, these quantum dots with violet light. And we'll use the, uh, the Blu-ray wavelength, Blu-ray disc, which is actually violet ray. 405 nanometers. So I got a question in office hours. Um, why are we talking about wavelengths that are over 100 nanometers? How is that nanoengineering? Well, large particle, and I, and I, and I, and I get it. We need, it's too big. But large wavelengths interact with small bits of matter. And you'll see that now. This two nanometer quantum dot will absorb this 405 nanometer photon. Now this 405 nanometer photon happens to be a bit bigger than the band gap, but that's fine because there's a density of states between the band edges. So it will absorb somewhere up here, then it will thermalize back down here, then the electron will go back to the valence band and emit a fluorescent photon. That fluorescent photon is going to have a larger wavelength and uh, smaller energy than the incident uh, photon. So what this does is it emits a photon with a wavelength of 490 nanometers. And this is the, the lambda max of emission. So this is if you have a plot of, of, of absorption versus wavelength, it's not going to be a straight line because you have a density of states on either side of the band edge. It's going to be a lazy signal, it's going to be a lazy uh, uh, peak, but the peak will be about 490 nanometers. And this is for cadmium selenide uh, quantum dots. Similarly, the 2.5 nanometer photon, oh, by the way, 490 nanometers is something like blue-green. 2.5 nanometer photon, the band gap uh, gets, uh, gets smaller. 530 nanometers, which is solidly green. Three nanometer. You get a 570 nanometer photon, which is somewhere in the green yellow regime. The 5 nanometer quantum dot, you get a 610 nanometer uh, photon, which is orange. And the 6 nanometer quantum dot, you get a 640 nanometer photon, which is, uh, which is red. Visible range, again, is about 400 to 700 uh, nanometers. And these are the fluorescent, band, the, the fluorescent uh, uh, wavelengths. So they will all absorb a higher energy uh, uh, light, lower wavelength light, but they will emit fluorescent photons of decreasing energy with increasing size. Yep? If you have quantum dots that are bigger or smaller, you get outside of the visible Yes, the question is, if you have quantum dots that are bigger or smaller, can you get outside of the visible spectrum? You absolutely can. So you can have UV emitting quantum dots, but they have to, you have to irradiate them with it with an even higher energy UV uh, photon. 
if you have uh, large quantum dots, you can have IR fluorescence. So it's possible to have, you know, we don't usually think of fluorescence as being anything other than visible light, um, but, uh, but you can indeed have it. You need a lower band gap bulk semiconductor to start with um, because the smallest this band gap will ever be is the, is the energy of the bulk. So you need to, I can't name offhand which one, it, which uh, semiconductor it would be, um, but they do exist. Yeah. So we always need a shorter wavelength and higher energy light than light we want. Exactly. We always need a shorter wavelength incident light than the wavelength we want emitted. So how is this, uh, how is this useful? Well, quantum dots can be thought of as inorganic dye molecules, but they have the advantage that they are uh, more stable to air. So if you have a, uh, if you have some beta carotene smeared on a surface, after a while it's going to photo bleach and you, it, it won't be orange anymore. Um, it'll be degraded by, uh, by light and oxygen. Quantum dots are more resistant to, uh, to oxidation. Usually what happens when you prepare these, because quantum dots themselves are insoluble in solvents, so that makes them not that useful um, from a production, a manufacturing standpoint. So what you end up doing is you, you put an organic ligand on them, which could be a phosphine or something. So this could be a phosphorus atom that has, say, some hydrocarbon chains coming out of it. And this, this, uh, this motif of chemical functionalization allows you to dissolve the quantum dots in uh, an organic solvent. So you can spread them on surfaces like paint and use them in things like display technologies. Okay, I wanna give you a couple of technological um, examples of how these, uh, how these materials are used. And the first one is in a, uh, an all quantum dot solar cell. And in your homework, I'm gonna ask you to look up this paper and just, just uh, so you have an idea of, um, of just how this, uh, how this research is done. You can read the paper or not, or you can just kind of skim and find where, um, uh, where, uh, where the information is. Quantum dot solar cells, which was published first by uh, Gurr et al. This was published by um, Oliver Sados' group at Berkeley in in the journal uh, Science, 2005, volume 310, page 462. And what they did was they built a solar cell on glass. And in the solar cell literature, the light always comes from the bottom. So the sunlight comes from the bottom. On the glass, you have a layer of ITO, which is indium tin oxide, 74% indium, 18% oxygen, 8% tin. All of you have lots of, in, lots of ITO in your, um, in your smartphones. They're on each side of the, trans of the transparent uh, display panel. This is used ubiquitously in, um, in optoelectronic devices. Then you have a, a really thin layer of Al2O3. Then you have your quantum dots and you have, or your semiconductor nanocrystals. You have cadmium tel tel uh, telluride nanocrystals 100 nanometers thick layer. And this is your, that means in five minutes, the people with the physics exam can 
uh, can leave. Um, okay, so you have 100 nanometers of the cadmium telluride. This is the P-type material. Don't worry quite about what that is, just it means it transports the positive charges. Cadmium selenide, also 100 nanometers. And in this, and, and the top, we have just a thin film of aluminum to collect the electrons. So this is n-type. So the electrons go up in this diagram, and the holes go down. And we, when you connect these devices to a load, it can power the load. In this case, the p-type nanocrystals are these rod-like uh, like structure, like nanocrystals. They are 100 nanometers um, approximately in diameter and one micron long. And then in this case, for the cadmium sel uh, selenide, you have these 500 nanometer uh, rice or football-shaped particles that were also about 100 nanometers along the short uh, axis. Now, if you look at the energies in electron volts, what we have, uh, what we usually, uh, what, we, what we have is the work function of the ITO. Then we draw the band edges of the N and P type materials. So this is the cadmium telluride of nanoparticles here. And then somewhere around here, we have the cadmium selenide. And then we have the work function of the, uh, of the, uh, of the aluminum which is somewhere around, uh, somewhere around here. And so what happens is when a photon comes in, this is sunlight, then one of these electrons in the valence band is, is promoted after the, the thermalization process to the conduction, somewhere in the conduction band. And then what happens is that this electron under, undergoes a photo-induced electron transfer reaction to the conduction band of the, uh, the n-type material. And then it's picked up by the, uh, by the aluminum. So, uh, so the electron ends up going this way. And the hole, meanwhile, is conducted out the other way. So the holes go this way. This isn't exactly how solar cells work when they're made of bulk semiconductors. This is sort of a special case. In, uh, in the case of organic solar cells and semiconductor nanocrystal solar cells, you actually need these two types of materials with these offset uh, band edges in order to allow this photo-induced electron transfer to, uh, to happen. And I see that people are getting a little antsy, so I'm going to give another example in display technologies, but for the next 30 seconds, I'm going to let the people that need to run across campus to do that now. How about quantum dot diffuser panels? In LCD displays. How does an LCD display work? Um, can I ask if that electron go up in energy in order to leave the system? 
Yes. There's actually, this is the top of the work function. It's actually, uh, it's not impossible for electrons to shift in energy a little bit. It just, it's, it's unfavorable, but it happens. So how does an LCD uh, display work? Basically, you have a you have white light that comes in. You have a rear polarizer. You have a liquid crystal layer that is controlled by a thin film transistor array. Then you have a color filter. which are the RGB uh, pixels. If you take a, a display panel and you look at it under a microscope, you have a little red, green, and blue uh, color filters. Then you have a front polarizer. So in the off state, what happens is that there's no electrical bias on this, on the liquid crystals. But what you have is a, uh, is a, uh, is a textured surface that allows the liquid crystal molecules to align in this direction in the back and then in this direction in the front. So you have two perpendicular uh, panels that align the liquid crystals. And what are the liquid crystals but um, an organic molecule this is called 5CB. The 5 means there are 5 carbon atoms out here. The CB, don't worry about it. 8CB would have a couple more carbon atoms, hint for the homework. So this molecule is, 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 uh, is, is a rigid molecular structure and they align when you, have, when you have a textured surface on this side and a textured surface on the other side in the, in the opposite direction, it aligns in this quarter, uh, this quarter helix. Now, in, now what happens is that the white light comes in, it's polarized the white light comes in at, at all, in all polarizations. It goes through the polar, polarizer and then it's polarized along this axis and then it slowly becomes polarized along this axis, goes through the color filter and then it comes out the polarizer unchanged because it's already polarized by the liquid crystals when it comes out through this, uh, this axis. When you apply a voltage using the thin film transistor array, you untwist you untwist the liquid crystal molecules to some degree, and that degree depends on how many bits your display is. If, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you have one byte, uh, then you have some, some, some number uh, fewer than if you have two bytes of information per pixel. So, uh, so as you increase the voltage, you can align the, uh, you can untwist the helix such that the, uh, such that the molecules are all pointed this way. There's no polarization of the light by the liquid crystal layer. And then when it comes through to hit this polarizer in this orientation, in this polarization, then no light comes through because all of it is polarized like this and it's all, it's all blocked. So, it, so a liquid crystal uh, di dis pixel that has no voltage applied appears its brightest possible color, and with the strongest voltage possible applied, 
it's its darkest possible color. Because there's some leakage here, you can never turn an LCD display completely uh, off. That's why new technologies like OLED displays have much, that's organic light emitting diodes, where each pixel is lit individually. That's why that, uh, that technology allows you some more uh, contrast ratio, because it's possible to extinguish a pixel ent entirely. Okay, this part I didn't tell you about, this is the diffuser panel. And in the case of quantum dot LCD displays, you put the, the white light coming in as a poor quality. It's too high in energy. It doesn't look good to our eyes at the end. If you put the diffuser in, what happens is that high energy light comes in. Those high energy photons, which are undesirable, are absorbed and re-emitted fluorescently by the quantum dots of which this panel, on which, uh, which this panel is, is coated. They're re-emitted at lower wavelengths so that when it comes out, they align, the colors align more, uh, more uh, naturally with the way that our, uh, our eyes are, um, are, are engineered to, uh, to perceive color, and that's why it looks better. Thanks very much for your attention. I'll see you on Friday.